came up, you said, you know, it's, uh, it's kind of changing with the new consoles and everything, with unified memory and all that. Um, AMD and ATI merged, they did that. That kind of made it easier for them to kind of jump in and do the whole unified memory thing. Um, how do you see that changing as far as consoles now, things are going to get simpler, easier, so it's more of a, of a, of a streamlined thing versus PCs having to use brute force to do everything to compete? So in the near term, it's definitely good for everybody, PC, console, developers, publishers. It's good all across the board right now. Uh, it will allow developers to build things in a console style. One thing that this would have, I never would have been thought this a couple years ago, but AMD has the opportunity where it's not out of the realm of possibility that we, they could expose a lower level API than OpenGL D3D that's, here's all the buffers, here's how you write it from a console, because we already have a nice layering. Adding another one, if there was a real value, there, there might be something to it. It's not clear to me that, uh, I think PCs will have their traditional tack of they're just going to be a lot more powerful. Uh, right now, you can certainly buy and outfit a more powerful PC than the next-gen consoles. It'd be expensive, but a couple years into the time frame, your run-of-the-mill PC will be a superset in every way to what the consoles are. Uh, and in fact, you'll see probably damn near the same chips in PCs, and then you'll see those with more cores and higher clock rates. Uh, so they're as always, the PC will be able to soak up a fair amount of inefficiency. It'd be, I guess I despair a little bit of, of actually vanquishing the inefficiency in the PC. We still win in the end just by clubbing it with more and more brute force. It'd be nice from an, an aesthetic sense that the inefficiency not be there, but I guess I'm a little bit more at peace with it. Uh, but the fact that the, the, the development of the PC and the consoles is coming closer together, but both those platforms should be looking over their shoulders at mobile and web and what's you know, kind of going on and driving the development issues there because those are, are the things that in the larger world, when you look at the billions of people playing that, uh, you know, they're not, it's not an argument between PC and console. It's a completely different argument, and those are probably going to have the broader repercussions as we look you know, five, ten years down the road. Yeah. Um, do you think those issues can be attributed to Mega Texture? And if not, are you going to use Mega Texture in future id games? So the performance issues on, uh, well, like on the PC, we had the disastrous driver problem, and we still have driver problems that, that crop up. Um, some of that is the fault of doing something that nobody else was doing. There's, a, uh, there's value to doing pretty much exactly what everybody else does. That's the well-tested path. Nobody will accidentally break something uh, that relies that everybody's doing. We were clearly doing something off the beaten road with, uh, with the mega texture, the continuous texture uploading, uh, all that entire pipeline of things. And it, you know, it hit the goals that we were looking for uh, on the consoles. Uh, on the PC, it should have just been superior to that, but we had you know, we had the disastrous driver problem, which colored a lot of people's views of it. And we still now occasionally have problems where Rage starts running crappy on somebody's system. Uh, it's still not a foregone conclusion that, as it stands right now, yes, we are still using mega texture, higher densities, uh, building with more texels on there, having more in the back that we can, uh, we can call, you know, call as needed, even if we can't ship them necessarily. Uh, but if we don't, the step that I would like to take uh, data-wise, and we just can't afford it on the current generation of like shipping on optical media, is if we could, if we could ship a diffuse map along with the, uh, the pre-baked light, then we have the best of both worlds. We have no downsides to dynamic lights, uh, where right now we have to just approximate them, but you can also have the, the full glory of the completely baked worldview. And we're still not, I'm trying to push more towards, we have all of this, but we're far from tapping out everything we can get out of it, where we have some technologies for letting people matte paint directly on the mega textures that never got followed up on. Uh, we should be able to fix every crossing edge in, uh, in the world, which is something that's not at all plausible to do in any other way. Go ahead and stitch across. Uh, every time you have two things uh, meeting, don't have that edge seam there that nothing can get rid of, but actually crossfade a, a little support texture around it. Uh, 
the ability where you know where we have used it with the stamping has allowed just fantastic advances in something that has no stability uh, issues or performance issues. There's big wins to be had there that we didn't make the most of and we're still trying to to make more out of them. In the end, when you say long term, data always wins. So something like mega texture will win in the end. Uh, whether it's you know whether it's dominant in a coming generation or it takes all the way to the transition for cloud gaming. When you look at a cloud gaming world where you're running on uh, a data center server, uh, having it's completely credible to consider having a, a petabyte of data for this entire glorious world that's you know that's built with cloud resources rather than on some local farm. Uh, over and over, in almost all cases, uh, cleverness and compression technologies eventually fall to just put the damn data there. Uh, it's possible uh, we were pushing a little bit too early on mega texture because it just barely worked on current generation stuff. Uh, but I think inevitably that's where things will be. Your tiling textures is just a very peculiar form of texture compression. Uh, and you, you expect to be able to have your entire surface spread out. And boy, I really want to be able to reference the surfaces as direct 3D coordinates, whether it's you know, some kind of voxelization or something, but I hate unwrapping and pelting things and adding gutters around it and all the issues that that adds to us. But eventually, you just want the materials of the world, what, what it makes up, and it's going to be something like a mega texture. Okay. On the topic of uh, virtual reality and uh, strapping a display to your head pretty much, uh, what's your opinion on doing something with pulling in input from the outside and doing something like dual Google Glass and having augmented uh, th actual 3D augmented reality? OK, so Google Glass and augmented reality in general the vision there is that you've got you know, Terminator vision, where you've got text appearing in front of everything, you know, the floating people's names over their heads. And that's going to be huge. That is going to be a many, many billion dollar industry. It's going to, I think, take over the way smartphones have. I think that uh, when that finally becomes real, uh, five years will go by and everybody will have augmented reality uh, goggles. Now, it's important to realize that what Google Glass is today is not that vision at all. It's a tiny little cell phone screen in your field of view. Uh, there are way hard problems involved in doing the, the vision of augmented reality about outlining people and floating things and chain, you know, adding solid objects into the world. And uh, Abrash and his team at Valve spent you know, a, quite a bit of effort on it. And, uh, I was pushing them really hard, it's like, VR we can do today. We can make this awesome. We can make a difference and it'll be spectacular. The AR stuff, it's going to be a bigger deal than VR eventually, but I don't think there's any guarantee that eventually is even going to start five years from now. I think we're going to see a lot more wearable stuff. It'll be the built-in cameras. It'll be the little info screens. What Google Glass is today will productize and will be valuable. But the game world of what you imagine that about, I want to put virtual people into those seats. You know, I want to, you know, I want to have the crater open up in the floor in front of me. That's not uh, coming in the real near future. Eventually it will, but there are many hard problems to be solved. Uh, before we get there. But the VR stuff's coming soon and fast, and it's going to be great. Yep. Um, so when we look at like the future of voxels versus ray tracing, just to, if you could elaborate on that a little bit. Yeah. Um, you know, do you think the idea of the infinite detail engine, even though that's largely like procedural, mm -hmm. um, do you think that would be maybe a stepping stone to ray tracing as you know poly counts increase or really do you think that's not even going to be considered in the future as ray tracing technologies meet performance expectations? All right, so eventually ray tracing will win. I think that that's a, uh, it's winning in all the offline space and for all the same reasons it will win in software uh, or in real time uh, applications. But we still have, there's a lot of leg room still for rasterization, especially as we look at mobile and lower power constraints. Uh, it was actually, I was stunned to find that I got disclosed on Caustic Graphics Technology, which is Imagination Technologies bought them. They're one of the mobile companies. And I've, I've looked at 
three or four ray tracing architectures over the years that have all been hopelessly naive. Uh, it's somebody that either knows enough about hardware to you know, build some form of a, a ray intersection engine and thinks, oh, we can use this for games with not understanding any of the many manifold issues that are involved with it. But the, uh, the caustic stuff is, is smart. They've got some, uh, it was one of those where I learned a couple things reading through their, uh, their technology paper that it's still not obvious to me that it's going to be a, that it's going to make games productized in this generation. I, I, I don't think it closes on that. You can do a real-time ray tracing game, but it's hard to show how it's going to be better than a rasterized game. My pitch to them is if you, you know, something that would be unique on there is you should do a, a, a jewelry toy, kind of like a super bejeweled, because that's the one thing where you really do care about your index of refraction and your colors on there. That would be the, the perfect poster child case for, uh, for a ray trace chip, is you can do this awesome jewelry tool. And bejeweled has sold a heck of a lot of copies, so that might even drive adoption of it. Uh, but getting your foot in the door with something uh, as a way to, once you're there, you can evolve and you can get better and you can eventually start encroaching on the, uh, the standard graphics territories. Um, and the reason why ray tracing is going to win is because it is understandable and tunable. Uh, the, you know, there's the, the great comment that somebody had on Twitter about looking at this 800-page book on shadows for GPUs. And you know, they're just basically saying, if, the, if you need this to do shadows, you're doing it wrong. Because in ray tracing, all you do is you distribute points to the area source of your light, and you, you, know, you trade off where you put them and how many you do. But it's simple. It's, it's a loop this big to make all of, you know, all of your shadow calculations, basically. And simplicity has a lot of value. There's, the lesson of the year, really, as, or of the age as we're going into, is that the, the things that we, do, we would do for optimal performance previously, uh, are many of them are ready to be traded away for better understandability, robustness, developer predictability, and so on. Uh, so voxels, and in terms of other representations of things, it still, it still seems unesthetic to me that we're ray tracing against triangle representations. Uh, but it seems like it's going to get good enough, like it's going to win. And whether you're tracing against a triangle or some kind of meta blob splat thing, it's at most a linear difference in performance. So it's not large. And I was, I would have been surprised years ago to think that some form of ray tracing, and it does wind up all being against triangles. I thought that there would be something else. Uh, that there would have been large enough benefits, but it's not looking that way now because it comes back to the tyranny of the pipeline. We have, everybody knows how to make these triangle meshes now, but uh, if we go to saying, well, now we need to build some kind of voxel thing, they'd still be making triangle meshes that we voxelize at some point, which is then sort of going through this additional media trans transition. And if you had the ability to just use the triangles, I, um, but an interesting thing about when you do look at the triangles now, and it's crazy the performance that we have on GPUs, that you can load up 20 million triangle models and they work. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's fabulous when you think about it. But uh, what's surprising is how bad many of them look if, they're, uh, if you've got any vertex operations going on, whether it's vertex specular or shading. When you've got 20 million triangles and you're drawing it on a 2 million pixel screen, the triangles are just randomly coming and going, and there are significant additional aliasing, anti-aliasing challenges to be had there. To your left. Uh, one thing that I haven't heard you mention for a while is um, AMD's um, virtualized texturing. Um, what, what is your views on it? Are you, would, would you consider incorporating into Tech 5 maybe for future games or anything? Yeah, so uh, we've been working with that uh, quite a bit, and we were uh, obviously the, the implementation test for the extensions going, going into it. Uh, it's, yeah, I think it's, I've been pushed, that had been my crusade for a decade to have virtualization of these uh, different things. And it's, I, uh, it turns out that the, the nitpicky details about page replacement and especially feedback from it is uh, harder than I would have thought 10 years ago. You basically wind up having to almost implement the, the Tech 5 feedback buffer sort of thing with all that messy stuff. I do wish that there was an ability to just have it demand paged to say, back this by my flash drive. I think that that would be a, a big step forward, but that involves interacting with the operating system. I, I think it's about as good as it, we, we were vetted on the extension. We were part of the, 
the specification process for it. And it works. Uh, it gives us some real benefits in that we can get proper anisotropic trilinear filtering with a single, you know, with, uh, without having to go through our mega texture pipeline for all these different samples. Uh, so it adds some benefits. It's surprisingly not quite as much of a huge win as you would think, considering how much code we do on the mega texture side of things already. The biggest benefit will probably be from letting us take advantage of all the memory space in uh, certainly the consoles. It's unclear how much the PC, where we want to be able to just say, OK, we've got this many gigs. We're just going let to our, let our pages fill up everything, where right now we say you've either got a set of 4K or 8K textures, and this will give us the flexibility to just take up what, however much we want. And there's still the, the trade-off that we have to make between how much space do we set aside for our compressed cache, where it's all uh, you know, DCT or HD photo uh, compressed at very, very high bit rates, versus how much do we set aside for direct access by the virtual textures. And one of the things that I'd love to do is, and it's not clear whether this is going to be feasible even on the, the current generation, is I'd like to not have, I'd like to use uncompressed textures for everything. If it means less pages, but we can have, we can at least take advantage of more memory there. But one of the problems right now is that we use a YCOCG uh, color space, which uh, we convert to RGB before we do our calculations, but you can't apply gamma correct texture filtering to a YCOCG since it's zero, it's biased into the middle. Uh, I'd like to be able to just use uncompressed 888 RGB for the, the stuff so that I could use, I could get gamma correct texture filtering, be uh, proper throughout the whole thing, but that's a lot of extra memory you know, looking at going from uh, 8 bits per pixel to at least 24, if not 32, if we don't pack anything else. But that's where we look at those things at the memory. We've got all this memory. I don't know what we're going to wind up blowing it on. We always wind up out of memory in the end. It seems inevitable. But getting rid of some of the compression artifacts there seems like it would be a positive thing. Um, this past generation with the consoles has been one, one of the longest ones uh, we've had in recent history. Um, do you think that it, it will, this new generation with the PS4 and the Xbox One will last as long as this past console generation? Um, and will it integrate augmented reality and virtual reality? So I think that it will last at least as long. I'm well, there's a couple arguments that could be made. I don't think it's going to be supplanted by a different architecture in that same time frame. Now, whether the platform can evolve is another question. They are getting more operating system-like in the way you interact with them. We don't get to you know, get our grubby fingers on the bits anymore, even on the consoles. Uh, so I'm sure there are strategies for evolving the platform as we go forward. Uh, but I don't think there's going to be much of a push for uh, for another generation for a long time. Really, we could be doing great innovative work even on the current generation for many more years yet. It's not like anybody's seen everything that you can do. If you take as a challenge, well, but I really want to do real-time global illumination uh, at 60 frames per second, I can't do that, wham me, on the current console. Uh, yeah, you can say we need new generations, but if we're concentrating on on making great games. I don't think that, you know, I'll be surprised if we see radically better games enabled because of the new capabilities on the consoles. And I've thought for a while we're at or past the knee of the curve and the payoff benefit. So we're going to be definitely on the, the gradual sloping part of it going forward. So I don't think that there's going to be a, a push for, you know, maybe we get to the radical ray tracing uh, platform at some point. That's, it's probably not worth changing off until we get to that point. Uh, but whether we get something like cloud gaming, owning large shares of the market before then, uh, or people using mobile systems where you just play on your mobile phone, it shows up on whatever screen's near you, that could become dominant gaming platforms. But a traditional next Xbox, uh, yeah, I think that's a long ways off. And it there's a credible argument to be made that there, there may not be another console generation as we know it now, but I don't know. Yeah. Do you think that the performance of non-volatile memory like SSDs and whatnot could ever reach a level to where it could be combined with system RAM? And if so, how much simpler would that make everything for you? 
So SSDs have been the greatest performance thing that's happened in recent years, much more so than multi-core has been for us. The, the difference that you get when you move to an all SSD system, it feels like the good old days when you just doubled the clock speed on your processor and you're like, wow, my computer's really fast. I, so that's been a really great thing. And I think an interesting thing that we've seen is while it's easy to say we'll always suck up whatever resources are available, and I, I just you know, said that uh, a moment ago, but what's been interesting to see is while there are definitely exponential trends, they don't have the same factor on them. Uh, we are seeing clearly that people don't fill up their hard drives and people are able to migrate to smaller SSDs. So I think that's a good thing. And having, there's something to be said for the silent PC as well, that you know, we don't have these big leaf blower flan, fans on things anymore. It's, it's nice to see something with no fans, no air movers. Maybe it's not as powerful, but it's not getting hot, and it's not you know, requiring to be blown across there. So SSDs have been really good. Now, what will happen in terms of integrating it like more directly with the system? I think that there's a clear path to that, and that's this embracing memory mapped data structures where there is a big benefit to doing that from a stability standpoint when you actually use memory protection and you say, this can't be touched. And we say, all right, we're you know, looking towards the future. We've got 100 gigs of something that we're going to just sort of have mapped here referenced. And whether it's backed by some combination of uh, cache SSD going to hard drives, going to the internet, or dropping the hard drive in between and just going cloud to, to SSD. There's, I, I think that that's a clear and obvious direction, but it still requires getting the OS and the GPU people together. But I think that's going to have big payoffs. You can't just say, well, I'm going to take my latest AAA game, map everything there, and have it run great. But the thing is, it'll actually run better than most people, I think, would credit if you did no optimization work on that. And if you just do a little bit of prefetching for setup, uh, I think that it'll be an improvement it, because it'll make software better. It'll let people build games without having to worry about how you're marshalling your data around. I think it'll be an improvement in, in a number of dimensions. Yeah. Uh, thanks for humoring us and staying here for two hours. I really appreciate it. Um, I was just wondering about your thoughts about strobe lighting and how that affects motion blur with current LCD technology. Okay, so the Valve's low persistence demo is, is a global, uh, global shutter, so it strobes the entire screen. And interestingly, they, they think they've identified some other perceptual issues with that, where you know, they think that when your eye makes a very fast saccade, that if it's going from a point where maybe there was no illumination, there's a perceptual thing that they're fighting. Uh, the other way of doing uh, temporary illumination is with a rolling shutter where you, like you're drawing the scan and it can be blanked out some distance behind. Instead of overwrapping and continuously being illuminated, you have maybe a quarter of the screen as a bright band going down. Uh, I have a theory that I'd like to see applied to this where instead of linearly addressing the frame buffer uh, in a standard scan pattern, if we went to a deep interleave pattern, say 8 or 16 wide interleaving, where you're getting scan line here, 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 and here, and then here, 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 and here, and they're blanking out 16 or however many scan lines a tenth of the frame behind, I think that might have a, a useful benefit there where you could be, at no point would any part of the screen be black. You would be within, say, 16, uh, 16 pixels of a lit line. So perhaps that alleviates some of those perceptual issues. Um, and you could also then look at it as a thousand frames per second uh, display that's very sparsely set out. And you could go ahead and render a thousand unique frames or do the time warping thing to that. And that's, uh, that's probably the best way to, to wind up doing this. But the fallback plan, sort of plan B, is LCD backlight issues where uh, the, the current light boost technologies on the, the NVIDIA light boost monitors, the, the high-end ASUS ones, they do a, a remarkably good job at this where they, they flash the backlight for four milliseconds, then they turn it off while the, the actual LCD is updating, then they flash it on for the alternate eye. And while this was designed to make 3D gaming work better, uh, to have the glasses work better, but it's a really good thing for any dynamic fast motion thing, as long as you're updating at that 120 hertz. If you're updating at 60 and you're double flashing, it's got this weird artifact to it that's perceptual. If you look at it on a high-speed camera, it's, it's doing exactly what it's supposed to. But if you update 120 times a second with those blankings, it's better than, you know, than any normal 120 hertz monitor. Uh, 
that's still a global strobe. So the alternate approach is, and I know I've seen somebody online doing the homebrew project with a string of L uh, LEDs that they're strobing in order uh, to do that. And that's, that's, a, that's a valid direction to go that can work even with slow switching LCDs. Because if you have an LCD panel that takes 15 milliseconds to switch, and there's a lot of them that are more than that. Like the current Rift one takes over 20 milliseconds to switch, and some of them are even worse. But if you're down to 15, if you're over 15, you're screwed. There's no way you can get the low persistence down. But even if you're at 15, you could have your scanning in changing the LCDs, uh, but it flashes it just before it's going to change, and it goes through. So you're flashing what's 15 milliseconds had time to settle there. Uh, and then it goes on, and then you can flash to the next bar and turn that one off while it's just starting to do its long change period. So I think that's, that's plan B for head mount display uh, technologies if you can't get awesome fast switching OLEDs on it, which would be, the OLEDs are the best way to go. If, if we can get that, that's what we want. Uh, failing that, the L LCDs with a strobing backlight. But the problem is LCDs are getting so tightly integrated that in the old days, your backlight was this separate assembly that you could just like take some screws off and pull it off and look at your transparent LCD, which is pretty cool. But now everything is these laminated packs of super high technology and getting, you know, getting into there to be able to strobe them is, uh, is an open challenge. And whether head mount displays will ever be a large enough market to make an LCD manufacturer make some change like that when they're talking about you know, millions and millions of mobile phones or other mobile devices, I don't think, you know, it'd be, it'd be great if the head mounted display market had that kind of clout in a couple of years, but I, I wouldn't hold my breath for it. You talked earlier about some of the um, issues with control devices. Uh, what do you think are some advancements to be made in that field in the near future? So control devices, I think that the, the near-term pragmatic things are going to be a split controller, whether it's like a, a hydra or two moves, uh, where you've got motion and buttons and position tracking. Uh, full body tracking, things like the, uh, the leap gesture tracking, I think those are going to have value, but it's kind of got the no button mouse problem with the, the connect and you start having to do gestures to trigger things, which becomes this very imprecise uh, direction. So I don't, I don't have a wish list like on the output side on display technology. I know exactly what I want. I, I don't have that so much on the input side. If anything, I've, I've got low expectations where I'd be thrilled to just get a great position sensor, a position sensor that had accuracy, repeatability, no drift. Uh, that, would, that would make me super happy. And it still seems to me that while the action does seem to be in optical, I am continually amazed by the fact that uh, RTK, real-time kinematic GPS systems, can give millimeter level uh, relative positioning from GPS satellites. And these are going eight kilometers per second up in space, you know, multiple ones, and you're getting millimeter level changes in distance. That's magic, you know, the fact that that can be happening and that we can't do better than that on a desktop with like some really loud carrier wave emitters in place down. I, I still, you know, I've gotten fallback research that I, I want. I'm trying to draft one of the one of the armadillo guys that's an electrical engineer into working uh, working up some prototyping stuff on that. But I, you know, there's there's camps and the optical stuff is certainly the one that's working best right now. Uh, but it's still not a solved thing. You still have to deal with occlusion issues and stray light reflections, all sorts of other problems that can be there. But the optical stuff's looking pretty good. Yeah. We know that as um, technologies uh, become cheaper and the uh, capabilities of an individual grow, that eventually indie, um, indie games will be able to craft experiences similar to AAA games. Um, I have two questions related to this. Um, first off, how far into the future, well, how far off are we from indie games like a, a just a single person being able to craft a similar experience to um, Call of Duty Modern Warfare 3. And what do you, do you think this spells the doom of the AAA, uh, AAA uh, game industry, or do you think they'll find another niche? Uh, I, I disagree with your premise. The, uh, the AAA games are they're the result of an army of people 
uh, doing their work. And it's not programming. I mean, programming is one of the, you know, one of the tent poles there, but most of the work is in content creation. And all the technology in the world doesn't suddenly turn you into an awesome sculptor. Uh, now, you can look at things like open asset libraries can start having a really, really big benefit there. And that's where, more so than the pace of technology,